Good afternoon. And I welcome you all to a very special talk today by Mr. Douglas Jones. I'm Tanu Gupta from Human Relations Division. As we all know, April is the National Fair Housing Month, and the city of Durham is celebrating the 48th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, which was a landmark law that was passed one week after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King in April 1968. Just three weeks after Dr. King gave his groundbreaking speech, I have a dream. An Alabama church was bombed before a Sunday service, killing four girls and injuring several others. On May 24, 2013, President Barack Obama awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously to the four girls killed in 1963. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings to our topic for today, race, relations, then and now, journey to justice. Now I would like to invite the Director of Neighborhood Improvement Services, Ms. Constance Stansel, to offer remarks and int introduce our speaker for today. Ms. Stansel. Thank you, Tanu. Good afternoon, and I too want to invite uh, thank you for joining us today on this very important and informative and what we hope is an inspirational experience. I, the first thing I want to do is recognize those city council members who are present with us today. I see uh, Councilman Davis, raise if you stand, and I see Mayor Pro Tem who promised me she would be here and there she is in the back. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Our guest speaker today is Mr. Douglas Jones, a founding partner and lawyer with the Jones Hawley <coughs> Law Firm in Birmingham, Alabama. Mr. Jones led a team of prosecutors in the reopened case of the 1963 bo uh, bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. He will share with us today what really happened uh, during the 1963 bombing and how the team successfully prosecuted two former Ku Klux Klan members for the murder of the four young girls killed in the bombing. Mr. Jones is a graduate of the University of Alabama and Cumberland School of Law at Samford University. He served as an assistant at U.S. attorney from 1980 to 1984 and was in private practice in Birmingham until his appointment as U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama in 1997. He served as a U.S. attorney until June 2001. But before uh, Mr. John comes before you, I would like to set the stage by asking Larry Revelle to share with us an editorial that Gene Patterson, editor of the, uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, published in 1963. His most famous editorial column was entitled, A Flower for the Graves. The sad occasion was one of America's most vicious hate crimes. The, the dynamite bombing of the uh, Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, the blast killed four young girls. Patterson's rage at his fellow white Southerners came out in every word. The column was deemed so powerful that in its time that Walter Cronkite asked Patterson to read it for the CBS News, Evening News. While some of the language may, may feel a little outdated, its clarion call for racial justice rings as, as loud and clear as ever. The next voice that you will hear after Larry will be Mr. Jones. A Negro mother wept in the street Sunday morning in front of a Baptist church in Birmingham. In her hand, she held a shoe, one shoe, from the foot of her dead child. We hold that shoe with her. Every one of us in the white South holds that small shoe in his hand. It's too late to blame the sick criminals who handled the dynamite. The FBI and the police can deal with that kind. The charge against them is simple. They killed four children. Only we can trace the truth, Southerner. 
you and I, we broke those children's bodies. We watched the stage set without staying it. We listened to the prologue unbestirred. We saw the curtain opening with disinterest. We heard the play. We, who go on electing politicians who heat the kettles of hate. We, who raise no hand to silence the mean and little men who have their nigger jokes. We who stand aside and imagine rectitude and let the mad dogs that run in every society slide their leashes from our hand and spring. We, the heirs of a proud South, who protest its worth and demand its recognition, we are the ones who have ducked the difficult, skirted the uncomfortable, caviled at the challenge, resented the necessary, rationalized the unacceptable, and created the day surely when these four children would die. This is no time to load our anguish onto the murderous scapegoat who set the cap in dynamite of our own manufacturer. He didn't know any better. Somewhere in the dim and fevered recess of an evil mind, he feels right now that he has been a hero. He is only guilty of murder. He thinks he has pleased us. We of the white South who know better are the ones who must take a harsher judgment. We who know better created a climate for child killing by those who don't. We hold that shoe in our hand, Southerner. We hold it in our hand. Let us see it straight and look at the blood on it. Let us compare it with the unworthy speeches of Southern public men who have traduced the Negro. Match it with the spectacle of shrilling children whose parents and teachers turned them free to spit epithets at small huddles of Negro children, school children, for a week before this Sunday in Birmingham. Hold up the shoe and look beyond it to the State House in Montgomery, where the official attitudes of Alabama have been spoken in heat and anger. Let us not lay the blame on some brutal fool who didn't know any better. We know better. We created the day. We bear the judgment. May God have mercy on the poor South that has so been led. May what has happened hasten the day when the good South, which does live and has great being, will rise to this challenge of racial understanding and common humanity. And in the full power of his unasserted courage, assert itself. The Sunday school play at Birmingham is ended. With a weeping Negro mother, we stand in the bitter smoke and hold a shoe. If our South is ever to be what we wish it to be, we will plant a flower of nobler resolve for the South now upon these four small graves that we dug. Wow, that was a powerful editorial. And the irony, I think, is that to some extent, so much of it can be applicable today. If you go back and think about it, we haven't had a, a bombing in, uh, like we had in 1963, but last summer we had a shooting in a church. And some of the same things can be said. We still see a lot of that. It's, it's, I, I usually try to start all these programs on a little bit lighter note, but after something like that and with all that's going on in the world, it gets a little hard to do sometimes. Things, things uh, change, and they change for the better, but for some reason they start rolling back. And, and um, the, the phrase that caught my attention the most was the politicians who heat the kettle of fear or whatever that was in that. That's, that's so often uh, the case that we have today. So let me, let me say um, how pleased I am to be here. Counselors, I appreciate your being here. Um, 
I'm really excited to be here to give you, uh, tell you a little bit about this story. I think uh, it has a lot of relevance for today. I actually feel a little bit at home sitting in the front row because the mayor of Birmingham is also named William Bell, so I, didn't, I wasn't sure I made my flight the right way this morning. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very pleased, and I have uh, one special guest I want to introduce that I'm a, a, so happy to see. Uh, Amy Gallimore, wave your hand, Amy. Uh, Amy is a North Carolina resident now. She worked with me for many, many years uh, and uh, was one of the team members that helped put these cases together when I was in the United States Attorney's Office. And I'm still struggling to get by in a, as a lawyer without Amy managing everything that I do today. So what you're going to hear today is in part, in large part, because of Amy and a lot of other great team members. Um, that we put these cases together. I get way too much credit for all that's going on. Now let me tell you a little bit about the backdrop of, of what I'd, I'd like to do here. This bomb exploded in September, September 15, 1963. I was nine years old. Birmingham and the surrounding communities was like most every other community, not just in the South, but really across the country. I lived in Fairfield, which is just outside of Birmingham. And it was a segregated community, white schools and black schools, white churches, black churches. We, never rare, we rarely got into downtown Birmingham in those days because there weren't interstates and there weren't the, the freeways that, that can take you in, on a moment's notice somewhere. And we didn't have all of the television stations that we have today. So things that were going on in Birmingham as a nine-year-old white kid in a segregated community in Fairfield was a world away for me. And it wasn't until high school when my school was finally desegregated, you know, some 20 something years after Brown versus Board, I guess maybe a little bit less than that after Brown versus Board, um, that the world for me became different and changed. And working with the black students and the black leaders was something that we did and we did well. Now, this case really didn't hit my radar until I was in law school. I was a second year law student in 1977 at Cumberland School of Law in Birmingham, uh, where I had many North Carolina uh, classmates, by the way. I think the next to Alabama, the state of Alabama, North Carolina had more Cumberland uh, students there uh, from North Carolina than any other state. And it was in law school that I cut classes to watch the first of these cases. No one was prosecuted these, for these cases, for these murders, for 13 years. And it was not until 1977 that Alabama's Attorney General Bill Baxley brought the first of the cases against a guy named Bob, uh, Bob Chambliss. And as a second year law student, I cut classes to go watch those trials, never dreaming that 24 years later, I'd be sitting in the same courtroom as a lawyer, as the United States Attorney, being able to finish that job that Bill uh, had started. So what I want to show you today is really a combination of several things. It's a history because we had to put together a lot of history about these cases in order to pull the story together for our jury. And it's a personal journey too, both to get these cases finished and to, to travel the, uh, all of the miles since those cases to be with you today. It is a continuing journey and one of which uh, I'm very proud. Now I'll tell you that as we did these cases and as we were beginning to get ready to try these cases, uh, we were all obviously concerned about the reaction of the jury. We didn't know. Birmingham was still living off the reputation that it had garnered from the 50s and 60s. The images of the dogs and the fire hoses. We didn't know how the community would react. Even though I was the United States Attorney we couldn't make the federal jurisdiction in the case, so we ended up trying the case in state court. It was the state of Alabama versus Tommy Blanton and the state of Alabama versus Bobby Frank Cherry, in which we brought these cases. So we did a lot of work, and we did focus groups, and what we found was the community was very supportive of trying these cases. They didn't want us to try these cases just to prove a point for history, but if the evidence was there, these were four little girls who died, and they de deserved the same justice. And so this community was supportive. This other thing that we found, interestingly, is that, but not surprisingly, 
was that the church itself was a victim. You know, Birmingham is part of the Bible Belt. We believe and have very strongly held beliefs of not only our religion, <clears throat> but our houses of worship, whether it is a synagogue or a church or a, a mosque. And so the church itself was also a victim. And so that's where we start. This story will be, show you a little bit about both of our cases. We tried two cases, one against Tommy Blanton, one against Bobby Frank Cherry. We had hoped to try them together, but there was an issue about Cherry's competency that came up, so we had to separate them. And we tried Cherry a year later. Blanton went to trial in 2001 and Cherry in 2002. But the stories are a lot the same. The evidence against each is a little different. And I'll kind of blend those two to talk to you today. But we start with a church. The church, if you haven't been to Birmingham, if you come through, and I invite you to come to a wonderful city that has got a lot going on these days, um, the church is at the center. The church and the Civil Rights District are at the center of, of the city. It is a very vibrant church today. We get visitors from all over the world. You'll see on some of these photographs, and by the way, do not feel compelled to look at me. The story is going to be on the TV screens. That's where the real story is, I promise you. And you'll see State's Exhibit. We used a lot of these photographs uh, in our trial. And the State's Exhibit number one was the church because that was the hub. That was what the center of the civil rights movement in Birmingham came to be. And the church today is very much like it was in 1963 with one major exception. If you look in the very bottom right corner of this uh, photograph, you'll see some steps, some concrete steps that led to the back door of the sanctuary. Um, those steps haven't been there since the early morning hours of September 15th when a bomb exploded that had been placed right underneath the very bottom step. But the church was the hub. Now, lawyers will also tell you that you gotta do a couple things. You want to start your cases strong. You want to end the cases strong. You also need to tell a story. This had to be a story. This was not just about evidence, pieces of a puzzle that came into play. This was a, had needed to be a story. And so we did a lot more than just simply look at old FBI records and files. We read a lot of history books to understand all that was going on uh, in Birmingham, to try to figure out why this church might have been targeted and were children children of Birmingham, in fact, targeted. But we start the case as a prosecutor very strong, and that's with the families, the families of these victims. This is a photograph of Alpha Robertson. This Robertson's daughter, Carol, died in the blast. The Robertsons lived just about five blocks from the church and were regular attendees of 16th Street. Carol had gone to Sunday school earlier that day, that morning, with her dad. Miss Robertson had stayed behind. Carol had gone earlier because this morning, this September 15th, was going to be a youth worship service. Reverend John Cross, the minister, was having the children come back to Birmingham, come back to 16th Street to participate in the worship service because they had had a rough year, one that we'll talk about and it will show you in a, in a moment. But he wanted them back at the church for reasons of faith. And so Carol was going to participate in that youth worship service and went down in the ladies' lounge to get ready. Miss Robertson stayed behind and was getting dressed for church when the bomb exploded. I asked her on the witness stand, Miss Robertson, what, what did you hear? What did it sound like? She said it sounded like the whole world was shaking. And truly, folks, that's what happened. The whole world did shake as people couldn't understand why, how, even in a city as violent as Birmingham, that a bomb could explode on a Sunday morning and kill four innocent little children. And frankly, it's some questions that we still haven't been able to answer despite these convictions, uh, which is too bad. But the ripple effect went throughout the world and Ms. Robertson really kind of set the tone for us. But then, pulling the pieces of the puzzle together and trying to tell the jury the story about maybe why this church was targeted. We went back and looked at more than just our case file and our history books. And what I saw was that over the course of a number of years, decades, 
So much racial violence in this country occurred as a result of school desegregation plans. When courts ordered black kids and white kids to go to school together, it was like the world was gonna to come to an end for some people. And there was a lot of violence, and that's what happened in Birmingham. In 1957, three years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision in which the Supreme Court said separate schools are inherently unequal schools and school systems should desegregate with all deliberate speed, one of the great leaders of the movement, Fred Shuttlesworth, decided he was going to enroll his kids in an all-white school in Birmingham. Phillips High School was in the smack in the middle of downtown Birmingham, one of the most prominent white high schools in the state, and Fred was going to enroll his kids that fall of 1957. Now, Fred was an incredibly courageous man. He never did anything under the radar, announced exactly what he was going to do. Now, so that, after Sunday, uh, that Monday afternoon in September 1957, when he rolled up in front of high, Phillips High School, there was a mob of white people waiting on him. So many, there were two or three hundred. There happened to also be a young man with a TV camera, and he caught on film what happened to Fred. Now, unfortunately, technology being what it is, I can't show you that film. What I can show you is this, a still. But what you would see if I could play this video would be Reverend Shuttlesworth, and you can see Reverend Shuttlesworth there on the left, and you can see his wife beside him. Reverend Shuttlesworth, you would see getting beaten, kicked, chased up and down the uh, street and the sidewalk. His wrist was broken, his face was scarred, his wife was stabbed with a pocket knife in the hip. And then there's a man that you can barely see. If you look right above where it says play, there's a guy with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Well, if this video could roll, it would show you that that man reaches in his pocket, pulls out something, and turns around and starts getting back in, in, into the middle of the beatings of Fred Shuttlesworth. Now, the importance of this video for us in our trials was twofold. Number one, it showed the depths that people would go to to stop school integration. Fred Shuttlesworth was a man of the cloth, a man of faith, an incredibly devout man. I mean, I'm telling you, I've met a lot, of, a lot of famous people. I've met a, a lot of men and women of faith, and Fred tops the list. I'm telling you, he topped the list. And this was a man of faith just simply trying to get his children a better education. And he faced that kind of mob and was beaten the way he was beaten. The important thing, and we play this video as an exhibit in the trial because the man up there that I pointed out was actually Bobby Frank Cherry. He had no children in that school. His oldest was only about 12 years old, but he felt compelled to violence to try to stop school desegregation. And now a piece of our prosecutorial puzzle kind of falls uh, into place. Now over the next few years in Birmingham, the civil rights movement, like the movement across the country, began to grow. And as the movement grew in Birmingham and elsewhere, so did Klan violence. In Birmingham and in Mississippi and in Georgia and in North Carolina and Tennessee and Arkansas, you name it. As the civil rights movement grew, so did Klan violence. In 1961, Freedom Riders came through Birmingham. Birmingham's government was controlled by a three-member commission. Bull Connor, the infamous Bull Connor here, that's shown here, was the police commissioner. He controlled Birmingham, a devout racist, uh, the, a Klan sympathizer, probably a Klan member, if truth be known. And in 1961, when the Freedom Riders came through Birmingham, right before they got to Birmingham in Anniston, Alabama, their bus was firebombed. If it hadn't been for a couple of brave state troopers who started firing guns that broke up the crowd that was trying to hold the Freedom Riders in a burning bus, they would have burned to death. These brave souls came on to Birmingham. But when they got to Birmingham at a time when everyone knew they were going to arrive on a Sunday morning, uh, on Mother's Day in 1961, there was not a police officer in sight, only Klansmen. And this was what the result was. There was savage beatings of the Freedom Riders. Put people in the hospital, bloodied their faces. When asked why his police officers weren't there to protect these people, 
Bull Connor made the statement that it was Mother's Day and all his police officers were home visiting their mamas. True story. Now, tell you, these you know, Klansmen were violent. They weren't real smart, though. Um, this photograph was actually taken by a Birmingham Post Herald photographer. And when they saw him taking the pictures, the Klan grabbed his camera and they broke it and they threw it in the trash can. But the fools didn't know to take the film out. So the cameraman just went over there and got the film, went and developed it, and this picture hit all around the world. Now, it so happened, and by the way, just as a little aside, the really large butt that you see in the right corner, okay, that belongs to Gary Thomas Rowe. Gary Thomas Rowe was an FBI informant at the time of these beatings. He was also an FBI informant at the time that he was riding in the car where the shots rang out in Selma, just outside of Selma, two years later that killed Viola Luzo. A really infamous guy who was involved in way too much. Um, but when this picture was flashed around the world, people began to be concerned about Birmingham. There was a group of business leaders in Birmingham who were, who were in Japan at a Rotary convention. And when they saw the reaction of their colleagues, they knew that something had to be done. They had their city was going to die. Now, maybe it's just me, but are there some similarities about North Carolina and businesses having some problems with things going on in North Carolina today? You know, I mean, p people ask me why we continue to live in these cases in the past. It's because, you know, things repeat themselves. And you can see it going on right here in the state of North Carolina. Okay, I'm going to take a step off my soapbox. So the, the leaders came back to Birmingham. They decided they changed the city government. They get, try to get rid of Bull Connor and go with a mayor, city council form of government. And it took them a while. And in the spring, the fall of 1962, the people of Birmingham elected, uh, had a referendum and they voted to change the government and they set an election for February. At the same time, Reverend Shuttlesworth was in Atlanta talking to Dr. King, imploring him to come to Birmingham to desegregate the most segregated city in America, as Dr. King described it. Well, they decided they would. The, 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 the movement had faltered a little bit in Albany, and they needed some help. And so they were to, if, if they could break Birmingham, they could, they could be successful anywhere. So the problem, though, was with the election coming up and Bull Connor running for mayor, they decided they better not come to Birmingham just yet because it would cause Connor to likely get elected. So they postponed the marches in Birmingham. Bull Connor gets a runoff, so they postpone him again. Finally, Bull Connor is defeated by Albert Boutwell. He doesn't leave office, though. He's still in office. But the movement doesn't wait, and the movement comes to Birmingham in the spring of 1963. And they gather at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Now, early in this crusade, which was called Project C for confrontation initially, Dr. King goes to jail, writes the famous letter from a Birmingham jail, ultimately is released, and the, and the whole Birmingham marches is still kind of only having a marginal effect. Then they decided that they would take drastic action, and it would be the kids who would take to the streets of Birmingham. The word went out on the radios with the disc jockeys of Tall Paul White and Shelley the Playboy Stewart to tell the kids of Birmingham, the junior high, the high school, and the college kids to come to 16th Street to march for freedom. And that's what happened. The 16th Street Baptist Church was the primary meeting place for the spring marches, now known as the Children's Crusade in Birmingham. And they would meet in the sanctuary where they would plan these marches. And they were only going to go a few blocks, just simply to City Hall to march for for civil rights and justice. And, but they no sooner would get out of the sanctuary, into the intersection right outside of city of 16th Street, where they were met by Bull Connors, fire hoses and dogs. And you've all seen these photographs. I show these primarily not to remind you, 
but to show you that they did, this march didn't go very far. This wasn't Selma to Montgomery. This was 50 feet or 100 feet before Bull Connor sick fire hoses and dogs. That's the church right there in the background. The dogs in the very intersection that these kids walked out. This is a famous picture that, that President Kennedy saw on the front page of the newspaper that said made him physically sick and it got him working on the civil rights bill. Bull Connor had a water tank. Again, remember, remember the images of Ferguson and other cities where police officers try to quell peaceful demonstrations with military tactics. And, and you see how that happened. Bull Connor had the audacity to paint his tank white. It's on display now at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute uh, in just across the street from the church. At one point, fire hoses and dogs were not enough. The kids kept coming, and so the Bull Connor had to have them arrested. There were thousands of kids arrested uh, in these marches in Birmingham in the spring of 63. So many kids that the jails filled and they had to do a makeshift jail at the state fairground where the state fair would meet once a year. Now while all of this was playing out on a national stage, these leaders who had worked so hard to change Birmingham, who were no friends of the civil rights movement, but saw their city about to die, once again, history was repeating itself and they had to take action. So they met secretly with Dr. King and Reverend Shuttlesworth and Reverend Abernathy to forge a very modest settlement to end the marches. This is a photograph taken outside the A.G. Gaston Motel uh, announcing this very modest settlement. It did, it did things like take the white and colored signs down from the water fountains and the restrooms at the downtown de department stores. It opened up the lunch counters all of which by law should have been opened up some uh, uh, earlier times with interstate commerce laws, but they weren't in Birmingham because of Connor. All of that came down. It even allowed the ladies who ran the elevators. Yes, and I know, I know for those who of you are too young to know this, you used to have to have somebody run an elevator behind a cage. You couldn't just punch a button. Those ladies but got on the sales floor and became sales clerks. That was a very important milestone for the African-American community in Birmingham in 1963. The, this announcement, this uh, agreement though, stopped short of requiring the city to hire black police officers. The city balked at that. That wouldn't come for a number of years later. But even with this very, very modest settlement, very modest settlement by any stretch of the imagination, the Klan was not happy. This is, a, this is a photograph of Robert Shelton. Robert Shelton was the head of the United Clans of America, one of the largest clans organizations based out of Tuscaloosa. He was the um, imperial wizard, grand dragon flyer, super duper poopa person. I mean, their clan egos matched their titles. I mean, it was just incredible. Uh, he announced on TV that night that that settlement would be Dr. King's epitaph. And sure enough, a bomb exploded at the same motel, the A.G. Gaston Motel, where Dr. King had been staying. Fortunately, he had left to go back to Atlanta. But now the die was cast, and two more very important pieces of the puzzle come into play for what would occur in Birmingham in a few months and then later for my prosecutions. To begin with, as we say, the Klan was not happy. They were seeing their segregated way of life sliding away, and they responded the only way they knew how, with violence. And the problem is that the second piece of the puzzle was that now the 16th Street Baptist Church and the children of Birmingham were the symbols of the movement. As much as Reverend Shuttlesworth and Dr. King, those kids and that church were the symbols of progress in the movement. And when you became a symbol of the movement in Birmingham in 1963, you had a bullseye put on your chest and on your back. And especially in a day when the Klan was getting angrier and angrier because they couldn't stop what they saw happening. Two weeks after this settlement, Reverend A.D. King, the brother of Martin Luther King's home, uh, was bombed. A couple of weeks after that, in early June 1963, Governor George Wallace stands at the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama to top block two kids, Vivian Malone and James Hood from entering the University of Alabama. Now, 
any, any student of history will tell you now in politics, that was all staged. It was never going to, to block any kids from enrolling. It was done as a publicity stunt for Wallace's career, fulfilling a campaign pledge. He was never, trust me, as a former United States attorney, that little man was never gonna stop the United States government from enrolling those kids. That's Nicholas Katzenbach, you see with his arms folded there. Standing next to him on the right is Macon Weaver, who was predecessor of mine as the United States attorney. But when George Wallace stepped aside, the Klan was incredibly angry. They didn't know it had been staged. They didn't know what was going on. They were armed Klansmen around Tuscaloosa waiting for the race war to start. Again, hearkening back to the Charleston shooting just a year ago and, and wanting the race war uh, to start. Now, interesting trivia, if you guys don't know this, um, one of the kids that Wallace blocked that day was a female named Vivian Malone. She's from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, her sister is a uh, doctor in Washington, D.C., who happens, Sharon, who happens to be married to the former Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. Um, so there is a lot of, Eric was back and Sharon back a lot during some commemorations. Uh, and so, so much of Eric's push on civil rights was not only because he was the first African American, a lot was so much personal about where we are as a country. And you saw him, I think, carry a lot of water on the racial dialogue that needs to be taking place in this country today. The summer, that, that same night, by the way, uh, President Kennedy announced that he was working toward a civil rights bill. Medgar Evers is gunned down in Mississippi. The violence step kept up in Birmingham in the summer of 1963. This is Arthur Shores. He was a lawyer, one of the great lawyers, later became the first black on the Birmingham City Council. His home was bombed twice over the course of that summer. Here's a photograph of the second bombing of the Shores home. In August, you had the High Have a Dream speech. 300,000 people on the mall in Washington, and hope was building. Everything was, was looking up. But in Birmingham, it was a different story because now, even though there had been great strides, there was an air of concern because after Fred Shuttlesworth got beaten up outside Phillips High School, a lawsuit got filed to desegregate the schools. And it took 15 years or so for it, to, not 15, but about seven or eight years for it to go up and down to the Court of Appeals, uh, Federal Court of Appeals. And in the s August of 1963, federal courts ruled that Birmingham schools should desegregate for the first time. First time. It, George Wallace tried to block those kids too, but he didn't do it himself. He sent, he sent, uh, sent state troopers to circle an elementary school to block elementary kids from going to school. I, I can't make that up. This was what was going on outside every white high school and other school in, Bir in Birmingham at the time. You see all of the protests, the waving of the Confederate battle flags. And I have been telling people for 15 years, long before Charleston, that if you don't believe that the Confederate battle flag has become a symbol of hate rather than a symbol of history, all you have to do is look back here at 1963. And I wish I'd have brought a newspaper that I found the other day that was part of the the, the material that Amy and I gathered for these cases. There was a, the, the state, National States Rights Party used to produce this newspaper rag called the Thunderbolt. Most racist thing you've ever read, just horrible stuff. And I picked one up the other day, uh, working on some things, and I looked on the back and there's an advertisement from June of 1965 in which you could go through the National States Rights Party and buy your Confederate battle flags. And this is what it said. I wish I'd have brought it. The Confederate flag is no longer a symbol of sectional history, but of white supremacy. Fly it proudly. So folks, we just need to get past it. And let's bring, it, it bring as many of those flags down as we possibly can bring down. So I don't think it was a coincidence that on September 10th, just five days before these bombing, these two young men Dwight and Floyd Armstrong walked into Graymont Elementary School. Birmingham was forever changed, but Birmingham was like a powder keg that day. All of the violence, 
it was simmering. It was about to boil over. You see Reverend Shuttlesworth leading the parade. That's Re uh, James Armstrong, their father, who testified at the Cherry case. Um, Re uh, Mr. Armstrong cut hair in Birmingham for 60-something years. He was one of our great foot soldiers, carried the flag in the Selma to Montgomery March. The man in the hat behind him is uh, Oscar Adams. Oscar was one of the lawyers on the case, later became the first African-American on the Alabama Supreme Court and the first to win a statewide election uh, to sit on that court before he retired. And he passed away a number of years ago. But you can imagine now the hate that was spilling out into the schools. And once again, the kids were at the center of the movement. So I don't believe it was a coincidence that on that September 15th, when the church is advertising that the kids and the church are going to be coming together again, that something was going to happen. There were four young girls that gathered in the ladies' lounge that morning to get ready, that were going to participate. This is Addie Mae Collins. Addie Mae was the youngest of the, well, she was 14, actually. Uh, this is not a really good picture of Addie Mae. We didn't have too many. She had come to Sunday school and church with her sisters that morning to get ready and had met them down in the ladies lounge this is Cynthia Morris Wesley Cynthia I think is an interesting story because she came from a family that had kind of broken up her dad had abandoned them she had seven or eight brothers and sisters and and they were all truant and a social worker had seen something special in Cynthia and convinced her mom to let her live with the Wesleys who had no kids and were educators after Cynthia's death and they became she stayed and they came to love Cynthia and they took her to school and they got her to church Afterwards, they brought in a little girl that they, by their own statement, they called the replacement for Cynthia, same age. That young lady grew up and got a PhD in psychology, has a good practice. The last I talked to her, she was in Texas. She'd come back, she never met Cynthia, came back, helped raise money for the church. And when you see such a successful replacement you understand what we lose and the possibilities we lose when children die. And we still lose far too many of them uh, today. Then there was Denise McNair. Denise was actually the youngest. She was 11, almost 12 years old. Fa uh, daughter of Chris and Maxine McNair. Um, you, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie, Spike Lee's movie called Four Little Girls. It's a great movie, great documentary. Came out about the same time. I became U.S. Attorney in 1997, and he focused a lot on the McNair family, and Chris was a photographer. And I'd been friends with Chris McNair for many years, and so in that movie he said this was his favorite photograph of his daughter that he took with her little camera. And, and that's why I used it in both of these trials. But there was always something about this that kept gnawing at me, and it wasn't until the closing arguments for Cherry that it came home. And we'll, come back to it in a little bit. And then there's Carol Robertson. Carol Robertson was the daughter of Alpha Robertson. And you know, folks, I, I, I got to tell you, and Amy will verify, we, we had an incredible group of people that put these cases together. But like so many important events and cases, and, and this case was an event, candidly, like so many important things in our lives, you have to do more than just simply prepare sometimes. There has to be somebody looking out for you and the planets lining up just right and everything falling just into place. And it was incredible how that happened for us. To just give you one example, when I was a law student sitting in the balcony watching Bill Baxley give an amazing closing argument, I watched him on a day in November of 1977 that would have been Denise McNair's 27th birthday. 14 years after the fact, Bill's giving a closing argument on a day that would have been her 27th birthday. And he talked about the fact that there was no joy in the McNair household, that there were no parties, there were no grandkids, there was no talk of jobs and careers. But that jury now had the opportunity to give Denise something she hadn't had for 14 years, justice. Just bring her killer to justice. It sounds almost trivia to talk about today, but I promise you there was not a dry eye in the house, including the 24-year-old kid sitting in the balcony, listening to Bill talk about the death of that child. 
Well, as fate would have it for us in April of 2001 when we started the Blanton case, and I called Alpha Robertson as my first witness, or one of my first witnesses, I did so on a day that would have been this little girl's 51st birthday, 51 years old. And now that jury fully understood. You could feel it. When, when Miss Robertson said that, you could feel something happen in the courtroom. And that jury understood what we had really been trying to tell folks all along, that this case is more than just about history. It is about victims. It is about families who lost loved ones and victims who had never felt the full measure of justice that we so pride ourselves in this country. And that jury got it. You could feel it that they got it. And they went and got to work and they understood it. It was an amazing, amazing moment. The bomb exploded about officially at 1022. This is a clock across the street at a laundry owned by Denise McNair's grandfather, Mr. Pippin. He was the man that was referred to in the editorial that was just read, bringing a shoe of Denise over to Miss McNair, who was waiting across the way. Time stands still on all of these events, and it certainly stood still in Birmingham, for, in Alabama, for so, so many years. Reverend John Cross came over from Atlanta to testify about all that had been going on. He explained the, the children's marches. He talked about the uh, mass meetings and the children's marches and how he wanted the children back in church for the series of youth worship services. Reverend Cross had always lived with the guilt of these children's death. And he was upstairs in the sanctuary when the bomb exploded. All the adult Sunday school classes were meeting upstairs in the sanctuary because the church had grown so much. And he, when, when the bomb exploded, there was bedlam and he had to go around. He couldn't go the back way. And when he went around and he identified most of the photographs that you may have seen a lot of these. The, the bomb was a very powerful blast. That, that what appears to be a window was actually a doorway uh, to the far right. And the steps went right along from uh, the big window where those men are standing. That big window was where the ladies' lounge was. So you can imagine that a bomb placed in that bottom step, that the brunt of it would go straight into the ladies' lounge where these children were. The bomb blast, the concussion went across the street, blowing out windows, it bounced back onto the 16th Street side of the church. You notice every window across the street was blown out, a powerful blast for its day. This is the 16th Street side of the, these are directly above, but there was so much concussion and there was so much debris flying about that even the 16th Street side windows were uh, damaged heavily. Even the stained glass window, this is probably the most famous picture of that day. This movement grew up in the churches, the black churches. And in 16th Street, there is a gorgeous stained glass of Christ as the Good Shepherd. And on that fateful Sunday morning, only the face of Christ was the, suffered the most significant damage. Uh, uh, even today, when people see photographs of that, it moves them uh, to tears. Inside, the adult Sunday school classes were meeting. We had a number of injuries. Fortunately, they were mainly superficial injuries. No one hurt too bad with flying glass uh, debris, destroying the windows, blowing the cars off of the curb, uh, away from the curb. You can see the damage that was done to this particular car, and then the Chevrolet there, how the brick and mortar flew through the sheet metal on the side of that car. And again, you can see across the street where every window uh, has gone. This is this was a, a very powerful blast, and we had to show how it was possibly could have done. The FBI came in, but could not determine what the exact explosive materials were. They, they really did a phenomenal job, but they just couldn't figure it out. Everybody assumed it was dynamite because dynamite was plentiful around Birmingham. At the time, there were like three or four dynamite plants. You could buy it, it's not controlled, it wasn't as controlled as it is now. So everybody assumed it was dynamite, but they could never really prove it. So it was important for us, though, to try to demonstrate this blast, and you can see that it went through 18 inches of concrete. Uh, the defense in this case had tried to show or at least infer that the bomb was thrown by a car. There was a member of the church that was outside that was still alive that they found. His name was Eddie Malden. And Eddie was about a block away, 
and he had seen a car, a station wagon with those Confederate battle flags on either side of it, ride slowly by the church, then take off real fast, and then moments later the bomb exploded. So their theory, since it was not Blanton or Cherry's car or Chambliss, was that the bomb was thrown. But this was way too big to throw from a car window, and it rolled perfectly situated, hidden underneath a f first step. They estimated it was 12 to 16 sticks of dynamite. And that's a pretty powerful blast. It completely destroyed the ladies' lounge where these girls were. Um, another famous picture that was flashed around the world. It tore out the window, exposing the stairs to the sanctuary. And then this photograph taken after the bodies were removed. And the sink that you see there becomes part uh, of our story. I mentioned to you about Robert Chambliss. Chambliss was tried first in 1977. The FBI closed the case out in 1968 without any prosecution. Um, and they just could not make the case. The FBI has been criticized a lot for not bringing charges. But I will tell you, having looked at that file, they could not have made it, uh, gotten a conviction. It was then the Klan shut, just clammed up. They, could, they tracked down so many leads, but so much of their information was informant information that could never use. And so the case just had to wait. And in 1970, Baxley gets elected as attorney general when he was 28 years old and finds that Chambliss and others were suspects early on. Chambliss was part of a splinter group of Klansmen. He was part of a group called Eastview 13, Clavern. A Clavern is a chapter of the Klan, and there were a lot of chapters. The Eastview 13 chapter happened to meet at the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge in Birmingham. True story. But there was a group of more violent Klansmen who would leave the Eastview 13 meeting and, and, and meet elsewhere because they didn't think the Klan was doing enough violence. And Tommy Blanton was a part of this group. This is a photograph of Blanton taken in 19, um, two weeks after the bombing in October 63. This is a photograph of Blanton right before his trial in um, 2001. Bobby Cherry, who's who I wanted you to see on the video was also part of that group. This is a photograph of Cherry, uh, and then a photograph of Cherry at his trial in 2002. And these guys were part of a splinter group known as the Cahaba River Bridge Boys. This is just south of Birmingham. There's a new bridge up there, but that old bridge you see still in use goes across the Cahaba River. And just, I mean, literally on the outskirts of, of, of the city of, of Birmingham. And the, they were known as the Cahaba River Bridge Boys because that's where they would meet. They would go underneath the bridge like a bunch of trolls, and, and that's where they planned this bomb. They believe one of the bomb makers may have lived in Cahaba Heights, which was just across the way there. Um, he, he had passed away long before we got uh, involved in the case. But they would meet underneath the bridge, and they would meet at the modern sign shop. And... The sign shop was about three or four blocks away. And all of these, there was a lot of activity. We had evidence of activity at the sign shop and the river the weekend before and the weekend of the bombing. And so another piece of our puzzle comes into play that we'll talk about in just a moment. We finally got these cases to trial. Again, state of Alabama, which is where it ought to have been. We moved these cases to state court, not federal court, because they always should have been the state of Alabama versus Bobby Cherry in the state of Alabama versus Tommy Blanton, because it was the state of Alabama that had let these folks down so much. You see Mrs. Robertson and her daughter, that's the McNair family, and then the Collins sisters were there. They were the most incredible group of families I've ever had to deal with. Junie Collins, uh, Addie Mae's sister, was counting the Sunday school money across the way from the church. She and were having fun that day, but she had had a fight with Addie Mae over a ring and she never got to make up with her. And, and Junie's had a, always had a difficult time. You know, you can't sweep victims under a carpet. We know that now, but they certainly tried to do that in 1963. And, it, and it, it had lasting effects on a lot of people. But Junie came and she was there every day. Eunice Davis came, uh, who was Cynthia's uh, sister. They were living apart. Uh, she heard about Cynthia's death on the radio and had to get her mom and go to the Wesley family to learn what, firsthand what had happened. Maxine McNair had taken Denise that morning to Sunday school uh, in church. 
Her husband, Chris, was a Lutheran, went to a different church. She, she and Denise said goodbye at the steps as Denise went downstairs to the ladies' lounge to get ready, and Maxine went upstairs into the choir loft where her Sunday school class was meeting, directly above the ladies' lounge. When the bomb exploded, I asked Ms. McNair on the stand, Ms. McNair, what, what did it sound like? What was going on inside the sanctuary after that bomb exploded? She said there was soot, there was debris, everything flying through the church. It was bedlam. People were screaming and hollering. We didn't know what had happened. We didn't know if it was a bomb. We didn't know if it was a plane crash. I said, what was your reaction? She said, I just screamed, my baby, my baby, because she knew the bulk of that bomb was right below where Denise was going. Her husband, Chris, heard about the bombing, grabbed a car and got to 16th Street as fast as he could, only to be told that he needed to detour over to UAB Hospital. It was called Hillman Hospital then, where they had laid out a makeshift morgue for the bodies of these four girls. And he had to go in to the morgue and identify the body of his only daughter at the time, only daughter, he's got two more now, only daughter at the time, Denise, still with a piece of mortar embedded right in the middle of her skull. Chris was a longtime friend and he was a photographer and he had a studio with a memorial room to Denise and he had a display case that had some of her belongings including the shoes she was wearing that day and her Bible and he had that piece of mortar and I finally I finally got up the nerve to ask him one time I said Chris you know this is this, this is just a little over the top for me I said I, I don't I'm not quite sure I understand why you put that out for people to see he said, well, Doug, let me tell you something. He said, people come by here all the time to learn about the bombing, to learn more about Denise. They mourn for the kids. They, em they embrace the history. He said, but until they see the mortar that was embedded in my daughter's head, they really fully can't appreciate and didn't appreciate what people will do and can do in the name of hate. And I never, ever questioned him again about that and we brought that mortar to the courtroom and we used it and we let that jury feel it and understand the hate that can occur and what happens in the name of hate Chris and these families were just amazing folks they were just absolutely incredible waiting for the wheels of justice to grind slowly but surely unlike unlike the defendants in this case Oh my God, how unlike the defendants in this case. These people were something else. This is a photograph of Cherry in 1997. Cherry was the kind of person, he, every time he opened his mouth with an agent, he would say something inconsistent or he would lie one way or another. Everything was, Cherry was the kind of guy, it, it, it's a cliche. How do you know Bobby Frank Cherry's lying? His lips are moving. Well, that's exactly the way it was. When we indicted this case, we had agents started to call us, and we brought back about seven or eight old agents who were so much fun to hang with, and they testified that every time they, that we went through all of the Cherry interviews and all of his lies and all of his inconsistencies, and at, in closing argument, I just, I literally put it up on a PowerPoint, and it's damning when you lie that much to law enforcement about a single event. And it was to him that day, that just lie after lie. By 1975, when he was interviewed by Baxley's people, he was living in Texas at the time. And by then, he just actually started making stuff up to the investigators. He, when asked where he was that weekend, he told them he was at the sign shop on that Saturday night, which he couldn't lie about because we had so many people putting him there with, with, Cher, uh, with Chambliss and Blanton. But he said he went home at 10 o'clock because his poor wife was dying with cancer, and he knew it was 10 o'clock because that's when live studio wrestling started. Now, I could never figure out, despite the fact that he was lying about all of that, if he really would have gone back because his wife was dying or because he wanted to watch the wrestling, but it didn't matter because we proved at trial that live studio wrestling didn't start until 1964, and poor Mrs. Cherry did die of cancer, but she wasn't even diagnosed with cancer until 1965, two years. And I'm telling you all that, but it, 
And as, but as bad as all that was, the real thing that got him was after he was interviewed by my folks in the summer of 1997, he, he did the one thing that targets of, a, of an investigation should not do. He called a press conference. And he was living in Maybank, Texas, and he called his press conference. You see the picture here. And that's one of his relatives filming him, himself in the background. And he denounced the FBI and the U.S. attorney and said he's been persecuted for 30 years. He didn't have any involvement. He was a Klansman, but not violent. And he was tired of it. Well, when that was shown in Texas and in Birmingham, the phones at the FBI office started ringing. And one of the first people to call was this young lady, Teresa Stacy, Bobby Frank Cherry's granddaughter. And the first words out of the to the dispatcher was, thank God somebody's looking at this case. Everybody knows my grandfather was involved. We, he used to talk about it all the time. The family would talk about it. Sunday dinners, they'd go on the back porch, and that's all he would talk about would be terrorizing the neighborhoods, the black neighborhoods in Birmingham, and bombing the church that killed those girls. And you can imagine the, the, the tone and tenor of the testimony that came out. She was estranged from the family, had had, had a tough life, and withstood some tough cross-examination but stood strong and was a great witness. She was the only family member to come forward for us out of a big family. Most, some of them couldn't because they were either dead or in jail. Uh, and, but she was the only one that really, truly helped us, the only blood family member. We had one other, a, a, an ex-wife, Willa Dean Brogdon. Willa Dean was Cherry's third wife, three out of five uh, for Bobby Frank Cherry. These Klansmen were also domestic abusers, by the way. Most of them, and, and he was in a, in a big way. And the interesting thing about Willa Dean is that she had dropped off the radar. She married Cherry in the 70s and then divorced him and just literally dropped off the radar. When I came, became U.S. attorney, we were talking about the case to the agents, and I asked them. They told me they were looking for Willa Dean. They couldn't find her. They had been divorced since 1974. Now it was 1997, and they couldn't find her. I said, well, surely you've got Social Security, you've got names, whatever. And they said, we're, we're, we're looking, though. We've been looking. We can't find her. I said, oh, for God's sakes, you're the modern FBI. You can't find a 72-year-old woman in this country. And they just kind of hung their head. Well, what happened? Again, those, those planets lining up just right for you. A, a reporter from Jackson, Mississippi, comes over and does a story about these the reopened investigation in the fall of 1998 and it hits the wire services. This is before all the internet stuff. It hits the wire services. And Willa Dean Brogdon sees an article about the reopening of the case in a hometown newspaper in Glendive, Montana. And she picks up the phone and calls the FBI in Billings 200 miles away and says, I need to come see you. I know something about this case. I was married to this guy. And she drove all the way to talk to the FBI. My agents in Birmingham were so excited, I think they beat her there. And she told them about how she was married to Cherry. He was a Klansman. He would bother the kids when he would wear his Klan robes. He talked about one time when his car broke down near, right by the church and she went to pick him up and he proudly pointed out the steps where he said they planted the bomb. And he kept talking about the fact that the bomb uh, being part of the, uh, the group that was making the fuse to the bomb. And to show you the kind of people, the mentality of hate that these people were, Cherry would on the one hand say, well, you know, no one was supposed to get hurt in this bomb. It didn't go off when it was supposed to. And in the very next breath, he would talk about these beautiful children as if they were animals and say, well, at least they can't breed. That's the mentality that we had. Willa Dean was an amazing, I had to pay her mileage. She wouldn't fly, I paid her mileage from Montana to come to Alabama. And I got some great stories about Willa Dean that we could be here all over. She was a, she, she gave, this is Cherry's defense lawyer. I'll tell you, she gave him hell. Okay, she gave him a rough time. She introduced us to her brother. Her brother verified the story that, uh, uh, that Cherry would say. Uh, a great witness. And then there was, well, there was one other I don't have a photograph of named uh, uh, Birdwell. Uh, Bobby Birdwell was a young man, 12 years old, playing with, in the Cherry household the weekend before the bombing. He was friends with Cherry's son, oldest son. 
And he talked about that weekend that he saw the Klan robes and it scared him. And then he saw Cherry sitting around the kitchen table with other white men talking about the bomb and the bomb being ready and talking about 16th Street. When a colleague of mine asked him why on, on direct, why didn't you call somebody? You were old enough to understand the importance of this. He said, man, I was a white kid in a Klansman's house. I was, I was scared to death. I'm not even tell my parents. And it wasn't until he saw the news that he felt that he could come forward. Michael Gowans was a Birmingham resident that had moved to Dallas in 1980 and was, was cleaning apartments that his mom had managed. Cherry, by this time, had moved also to Dallas and was had a carpet cleaning business. And in a conversation that took place in 1980, which I think is truly one of the more remarkable ones for today, we keep talking about our lessons for today and race relations then and race relations now, race relations in a much broader context. This is the, this is the testimony. And I apologize to each of you, and I apologize to the TV audience for the language, but this is the testimony. Michael Gowen said that they're complaining about the rise of the Hispanic population in Dallas in 1980. And Bobby Cherry says, well, we just need to take care of the wetbacks the same way we took care of the niggers in Birmingham. And he talked about bombing the church that killed, proudly bombing the church that killed those four little nigger girls. Now that was a conversation in 1980 in which somebody is saying we need to take care of Mexicans the same way we took care of black folks. We have ways of repeating history, folks. And there are so many things that we need to do as this country, this state, my state, become ever more diverse. We have got to remember those kind of conversations and what happened uh, in North Carolina and in Alabama in the South in the 1950s and 60s. Michael was a great, all these folks were just incredible, incredible witnesses. Now, Blanton case was a little bit different. Blanton was more of a hermit, lived by himself, uh, kept to himself, didn't do a lot of talking to a lot of people. But two weeks before the bombing, the man in the hard hat that you see there, James Lay, is riding by 16th Street Baptist Church. He was part of a volunteer group that would leave their day jobs and go and ride around and try to protect the homes of the civil rights leaders in the churches. And two weeks before the bombing, at 1 o'clock in the morning, he's riding down 16th Street by the church, and he sees a car parked right there on the curb by those steps. And there's two men, white men there, one standing by the car, the other over by the steps. And the man by the steps is holding what Mr. Lay called a grip. It would have been a, a gym bag or something along those lines. He called it a grip. And when he hit his bright lights, they jumped in the car with the grip and they took off. He found a buddy that was living in a rooming house. They looked around. They didn't see anything. They called the Birmingham police and the Birmingham police came out to investigate and they told him, just go on home, boy. You didn't see a damn thing. Boy was the name given to all black men in Birmingham by the Birmingham police, regardless of their age. So just going home, boy. You didn't see a damn thing. Well, two weeks later, he's a few blocks away when the bomb explodes, and he gets the hard hat and the, the bullhorn, and they help keep order, and he helps remove the bodies, and he tells the FBI what he saw. And they take him up, and he, they show him all of the photographs of Klansmen. They verify with the police what happened, and they show him these pictures, probably 100 or so pictures. And out of the 100 or so pictures, he picks out two people that he believes were the ones there that night. The guy standing over by the car was Dynamite Bob Chambliss, who actually prosecuted in 77. The guy standing with a grip by the steps, Tommy Blanton, who would later prosecute. Now, that was strong circumstantial evidence. So now Blanton and Chambliss are certainly suspects early on. They were also suspects because Blanton's car was seen in night, uh, uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning. This is Blanton's 1957 Chevrolet. It was seen at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, by this lady, Gerthus Glenn. Mrs. Glenn was visiting from Detroit at the time, and she was trying to park her car at 2 o'clock in the morning about a block behind the church. 
And she came across Blanton's car and the dome light was on and there were three white men in it, one of whom she was able to positively identify as Chambliss. This is a photograph of Mrs. Glenn testifying at the Chambliss case in 1977. Unfortunately, Ms. Glenn passed away and we couldn't use her testimony even though we were able to establish the time that the car was spotted. I couldn't use her testimony. I tried every lawyer trick in the book to try to get the defense to open the door to let me use that transcript. Since Blanton had never cross-examined her, we couldn't use it, but if I could somehow get him to do something to open that door, then I could maybe get it in. Well, the problem was that the lawyer for the defense was a former partner of mine who I helped train as a baby lawyer. He knew all of my tricks. So I couldn't get that, but we did get the time in. And here's why the time was important. Because two o'clock became a very important time because when Blanton was interviewed, the picture that you saw earlier, when he was interviewed two weeks after the bombing, he couldn't remember where all he had gone that night. He had remembered that he, had, he knew that he had taken his girlfriend Jean out that night because he had broken the date the night before, but he couldn't remember anywhere they went. He said, I, I'm, just, I'm blank. The only thing he remembered about where they went that night was that he had her home by midnight. She was only 17 and he had her home by midnight. Then he said he went home and went to sleep. And then Agent Spencer with the FBI confronted him with Mrs. Glenn and said, well, look, Tommy, we've got a witness who has your car at 2 o'clock in the morning behind that church. Plenty enough time for you to go get your buddies and plant that bomb. Well, he clams up. And by his admission and Jean's, his girlfriend, they get their stories together. And lo and behold, the next interviews, they know exactly where they were minute by minute. They went, he picked her up at such and such time. They went and got a bite to eat at Ed Salem's drive-in. Then they went up to Vulcan. If you've ever been to Vulcan, we, Birmingham, we got this big old iron statue that, of, of an iron man that overlooks Bar Birmingham. And they went up there to go parking, which I was told was a good parking place. I don't, I, I don't know anything about that, but I was always told that. And lo and behold, he had her home at midnight. But guess what? Now they remembered he didn't leave. He fell asleep on her sofa. And he stayed there until 2.30 or 2.45. And I'm telling you folks, that alibi kept him out of jail. Kept him out of jail for so, so many years. I promise you, if you got an iPhone, go to iTunes, look up Tammy Wynette, Stand By Your Man, you're going to see Gene's picture. They got married, they got divorced, they got married, they got divorced, depending on these cases. She stood by him through thick and thin, even through the interviews that we did. But it was still, he was still a hot focus. And so the FBI recruited Mitchell Burns to become an informant. Mitchell was an FBI, uh, an informant. He was a Klansman, an ex-Marine who was not a violent guy, but certainly a Klansman. And it took him a while, but finally, after working on him for so long, the agent stopped him, took him home at, uh, one afternoon, stopped, showed him the pictures of those children in the morgue, and he broke down on the side of the road and said, I'll do whatever it takes. And for two years, Mitchell Burns was an informant. He would ride around with a tape recorder, trying to get, you know, trying to get Blanton to talk. He was focused on Blanton. Every time they would go out, you know, by this time, the Klan was convinced that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI was putting wiretaps on all their phones, bugging their homes, bugging their cars, and, and he was. He was doing all that. He had wiretaps everywhere. So every time they would go out, Blanton would always say, Mitch, we need to go in your car because you know the FBI's got mine bugged. Well, they, he was an informant. They had his buck. <laughs> now, we, we caught on tape. We had 26 excerpts that we played, uh, and we never got the, the real smoking gun on tape. The, but, but we had things, the hate that would come out of Blanton's mouth. I'm watching my time here, okay? was incredible. Things he would do when he would bomb his next church. Yeah, how he loved to go bombing. There was one time when the tape didn't get, couldn't get turned on because they couldn't get approval, where they went to pick up Cherry. And, and, and Blanton makes the statement, this is the alley and we almost missed the night we bombed the church. And inside, Cherry's talking about throwing the FBI off of, about where the bomb was actually made. One time on tape, Cherry is on there and he's, he's bragging about how many times he's lied to the FBI to throw them off. That's a prosecutor's dream when you got a defendant bragging about lying to law enforcement. Mitch is a great 
was an absolute remarkable uh, witness for us. And then there was John Calvin. And I'm, if, for those of you who are listening, I'm about, get, about ready to play that tape. I'll cue you in a second. Um, John Calvin was an FBI um, technician. He worked in the electronic surveillance. And he posed as an undercover guy. He went undercover and posed as a truck driver and rented an apartment next to Gene and Tommy Blanton in, in the summer of 1964. And they tore out a wall between the two apartments and there was a hole underneath the, the Blanton kitchen sink. And he put a microphone that he attached to a telephone that went back to a tape recorder at the FBI office, one of Hoover's famous bugs. And in June of 1964, they catch on tape a conversation between Gene and Tommy. If you'll roll that tape. Cut it now. Three times. Three times out of one of these guys' own mouth, he's talking about being part of the group that planned the bomb and made that bomb. This, this tape had been sitting in a box in the FBI office for 30-something years and had been listened to since it had been made. Now, in fairness to the FBI, they never dreamed it could be used in evidence. It was made under a different theory. They didn't think they could use it. Um, so I, I don't blame them for it, but we, we didn't even know this tape existed when we indicted the cases. We found it in discovery when I had the agents listen to all these old tapes that we were told had nothing on them. And now I've got two important things. One is, is, is the admission, damning information, but just as important, the alibi that had kept him out of jail right there, she talks about lying to the FBI. She knew who a certain person was who we've always thought had some knowledge or involvement in the bombing, Mary Lou Holt. But she didn't want to tell him, and so she lied to the FBI. Now the, the, the alibi that kept him, off, kept him out of jail doesn't even take the witness stand on his behalf because she knew that we would eat her up. Didn't even. And I, I met with her, by the way. I met with Jean. Before we turned this tape over to the defense, we brought her in. Amy was there. We sat all day. I played this tape for her so many times that I am, I am fearful that when I start to leave this world and the light gets brighter, I'm going to hear something going, well, Tommy. And I, I may just go the other way regardless of which it is. But, and I told her, because I met with all these folks, and I told her, I said, well, Gene, look, you need to help me because I need to tell you something. I need to tell you the truth. And I did tell her the truth. I said, Gene, you got to know this. He did go out with Waylene on that Friday night. <laughs> She wasn't as amused as you are, but she still didn't, she still didn't help. I heard her husband had tried, but she just, she stood by her man. And we tried, and we found Waylene, by, that, by the way, because Tommy did date her. She had retired from the Air, uh, Army and was living in a little mobile home in a rural part of Alabama in a, that was in a field. And we didn't tell her we were coming, and we drove with these big old FBI sedans and got out, and I, there's this little short lady standing on the porch of a Winnebago, essentially. 
And I walk up to her and I said, Miss Vaughn, my name's Doug Jones. I'm the U.S. attorney in Birmingham. And she just smiled and said, I've been expecting you, Mr. Jones. She knew it was just a matter of time. She talked about how scared she would be when Blanton would take her out and he would take her to Klan meetings and how he would try to run black men over in his car to, and, and knew he could get away with it and how sometimes he would stop the car in the middle of the black neighborhood in the front of a, a grocery store and go down with a, a vial of sulfuric acid and just pour it down the, the meat counter. That's the kind of people that we were dealing with. But at the end of the day, things have to line up just right. I'm going to wind this up. I know it's getting late. Two things I want to tell you about. Before I became, as I became U.S. Attorney, I told my staff I wanted to work on this case. And they said, don't get your hopes up, Doug. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's an old case. People are dead, people are dying. I said, well, if we don't do it now, it'll never get done. And I didn't realize how prophetic that really was. Two months before the Blanton case, James Lay has a stroke. I was in danger of losing that testimony that we talked about earlier. And I went to visit him, and his mind is still good, but he's paralyzed. And I talked to doctors and nurses, and I'm going to bring him in in a, in a wheelchair, and I'm going to read him grand jury testimony. He was an incredible grand jury witness. I mean, soft-spoken, grand jury leaning over everything he said. And the rules of evidence would have been, let me do this. Just read him the questions, read him the answers, and say, Mr. Lay, is it true? And he would nod. And then the defense wouldn't have much they could do on cross. But then we got in the middle of trial. And I come in one day, and my agent say, Doug, we got another problem. Agent Spencer, who was the agent that Blanton had lied to, was being driven up from Birmingham, to Birmingham from Tampa, and they got as far as Montgomery, 90 miles south of Birmingham, and they think he's had some kind of heart failure. He's in intensive care. So think about this. Here I am in the middle of trial. Our jury selected. Jeopardy's attached. And I got one witness in a nursing home and a one, one witness in intensive care. Well, fortunately, Agent Spencer was okay. His doctor, when he found out who he was and what he was doing, canceled every appointment to come up with him and sit in court the next day. As an accommodation to a daughter who was scared to death for the health of her father, our judge next to us did away with court that day and we had two paramedics with crash carts, defibrillators, the whole nine yards ready to go. Agent Spencer was great, the oldest agent to ever testify in a criminal case. And he was wonderful talking about the lies of Tommy Blanton. But I got worried about James Lay. So I came back and I cut a deal with the defense and we just read his testimony. My jury didn't get to see this man. I wish they had him. But at least I got the testimony that I needed to get out. And the point of this story is to tell you that after the Blanton conviction, he would only be a witness in the Blanton case. After the Blanton conviction, 30 days after, I go on a vacation, I come back, and I pick up the newspaper, and I see where James Lay had died. Had we continued that case 60 days, I could have never cut that deal with the defense, and we'd have lost that testimony forever. A year later, it was John Colvin, who goes in the, about a month after the Cherry case, who authenticated the tape, and dies of a recurrence of cancer. About the same time, I'm getting a call from Alpha Robertson, who was set to go to New York with me in August to get an, I was getting an award from the Congress of Racial Equality, and she was picking up one posthumously for the girls. And she called to say her test had come back, and she couldn't go. I went by to say goodbye and went on to New York, and on a Sunday afternoon when I'm giving this speech, she passes away. She was a remarkable lady, I gotta tell you. When I went to her memorial back in Birmingham, her son at the end comes running over. He said, thanks again, Doug, for coming. But more important, thanks for what you did. It's because of you, she died with a smile on her face, and it doesn't get any better. Thanksgiving, Mitchell Burns wakes up two days before Thanksgiving, right after the Cherry case, and dies of a heart attack. Mitch lived and died a Klansman, but not a violent guy, and never hesitated to come back and do the right thing for these children and these families. Michael Goins died a year later. He was suffering from emphysema. All of these people never asking for rewards, never asking for recognition, just doing the right thing. A little bit later, it was Reverend John Cross, who was one of my heroes, kept the lid on Birmingham by grabbing the bullhorn when people learned that folks had died 
and started preaching that morning Sunday school lesson, which ironically was the love that forgives. Eunice Davis, Cynthia's sister, passes away. Reverend Shuttlesworth has passed away. Mr. Armstrong's passed away. Agent Spencer's passed away, all gone. Of course, it, we've had quite a few years pass now, but so many died within just the right time. It's just as if they had waited for just the right time to leave. And then it wasn't just the defense, uh, witnesses. 12 years ago, Bobby Frank Cherry dies in an Alabama prison, and I make no apologies for him dying in prison. He should have been there many, many years ago. Blanton is still uh, in prison today. And finally, I want to tell you the story of the sink, because history often forgets a very important part of this story. Fortunately, it's become a little bit better known now, but history often forgets a very important piece. And the sink was a part of our story because our last witness was going over to that sink to wash her hands. History forgets that there were actually five little girls in that lady's lounge that morning. Four died and one survived. And the survivor, Sarah Collins Rudolph, was a sister of Addie Mae. And she had gone down and come to Sunday school and church with her sisters and was so excited about this event that they were all going to participate in. And she walked over to the sink, and as she's walking over there, she hears the niece say something about her dress. And I asked her, you know, Sarah, what did you do? She said, well, I got to the sink, and I turned around and just looked back in the room. I said, what did you see? She said, well, I, I saw my sister tying the sash of Denise's new dress. Well, then what happened? She said, well, then there was the explosion. And I was buried under all this rubble, and I couldn't breathe, and I couldn't see. She's still blind in one eye. I said, what did you do? She said, I called out for help. I said, what did you say? She said, I just called out for my sister. I called, Addie, Addie, Addie. Her voice just rising up, just like in that courtroom, just like it did 37 years earlier in that catacomb. I said, did you ever hear her respond, Sarah? No, sir. Did you ever see her alive again? No, sir. And with that, I looked up at Judge Garrett and said, Your Honor, the state of Alabama rest its case. It was a pretty remarkable ending to a remarkable story. It took the jury about two and a half hours to convict Ch uh, Blanton on the strength of that tape. It took the jury about six to convict Cherry. Black and white, young and old, male and female jurors, a cross-section of Birmingham and Jefferson County. And at the end of the day, end of the day there's so much you can take there's so much you can learn I try not to talk too many lessons but I told you I was going to come back to this photograph because this photograph haunted me and in the closing arguments before Cherry it finally dawned on me I walked into my in my study uh, from my study into the den where my daughter's watching a movie called the Shawshank Redemption you may have seen it lawyers get their inspiration from craziest places sometimes and in that movie, Morgan Freeman's reading a letter from his friend who had escaped from prison. Morgan Freeman just gotten out, and this letter is talking about hope, and that hope was a good thing, and good things never die. And it dawned on me that maybe that's what this photograph is about, and I told that cherry jury the next day that this image captured everything about the case and the trials. It was the image of the kids who marched through the streets of Birmingham, for freedom and justice. It was the image of the injuries to Sarah. It was an image of the deaths of the children. It was the image of a mother's heart that never stops crying over the death of a child. But it, more importantly, it was an image of hope. A young black girl holding her best friend, a white chatty Cathy doll. And in 1963, it was a, it was a hope of a of a race of people in this country, but in today's diverse world, it's really the hope of the country and the planet. As we become ever more diverse, we've got to be and continue to be on the lookout. The Bobby Frank Cherries and the Tommy Blantons of this world still exist. They want to dash the hopes and dreams of everyone, and it does, that doesn't look like them or talk like them. They want to dash the hopes of the Mexican immigrant, of the LGBT community, of the Muslim. They want to dash the hope and promise that this country has for all of its people. And, but we can always remember that hope that we all carry is a good thing. 
may be the best of things, and good things never die. And at the end of the day, this case was about truth. It was about justice. I am so proud to have been involved, to have Amy involved. It changes the way you look at the world. It is a life-altering experience, I promise you. So thank you for letting me tell this story. I hope you will leave here with more information than you came in and can take the word out to wherever you're going and we can all have a better, beloved community. Thank you so much for letting me share the story. Thank you. Very touching, very touching. Thank you so much for sharing the story with us, Mr. Jones. Please give another round of applause for Mr. Jones. Now I would like to recognize people who have worked hard to make this event a success. And I will start with our very own, very supportive, very hardworking, the Director of Neighborhood Improvement Services, Ms. Constance Stansel, who is committed to common goods for all and justice for everyone. Please give a big round of applause to Ms. Stansel. This event would not have been successful without the support and guidance of Human Relations Division Senior Manager, Ms. Delilah Donaldson. I would also like to thank my colleagues, Juanita English, Cheryl McDonald, Larry Revel, and Lenin Martinez. Thank you all for joining us here today. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much.